Hi everybody, this is Ron Gadget Man. Uh, and what this is is an explanation of the Gadget Man Groove, how and why it does what it does, and why you're seeing all these reports of mileage gains and horsepower and torque. Uh, let's first understand a little bit of the, uh, the basic functioning of an engine. Crankshaft is the, the rod that goes through the center of your engine. To it is attached the pistons. As the crankshaft turns, it will pull the pistons up and down because as it's built, comes in line, comes over, up and down. To this little section is connected the piston, which as the engine rolls, it pulls and does this kind of motion. All right? Now, with that in mind, as the crankshaft is at top dead center, there's zero vertical movement of the piston. Uh, now, we're only going to be talking about the intake stroke because that's when the gauge main groove does all its magic. So at the top dead center, the intake valve is getting ready to open, and there's no vertical movement of the piston, hence no demand for the air. Then the valve opens, and the, and the piston begins to decrease, decline. And here, as it reaches 90 degrees, just slightly before that, the piston is moving the fastest it possibly can. Then it begins to slow until it reaches bottom dead center. This creates a pressure wave inside the engine, something like this. This is 17 inch medium vacuum, as measured in inches of mercury, 19 inches to 15 inches is what you get. Okay? Now that's roughly, it varies from engine to engine. But this is as the piston begins to drop, it speeds up, and then it begins to slow down, causing a drop in the vacuum. What the Gage Man Groove does is it amplifies this pressure wave in a dramatic fashion. Now, in, in order to understand how it works, we've put together a few things. Here's your throttle plate, your throttle body. In a normal engine, that's what they use. Every engine that I've ever done, every gasoline-powered car or truck, has a throttle plate in it. The Gadget Man Group takes advantage of this and the aerodynamics here to create this amplification of the waveform. Now, look at how this works. All of the air, we'll say, is moving this direction into the engine. So, this plate is sloped. So, all of the air that hits this plate in order to continue traveling this direction has to go down the plate and then up and into the engine. So all of this is forced into this very tiny area here at the bottom of the plate, creating a really high pressure zone right there and a very low pressure zone there. It's all about balance. Okay? This is up here is where your air bleeds come off of your throttle bodies when you have them. The air bleeds on the inside, they're called uh, vacuum ports on the outside. All right. So that's a normal throttle line. Now let's expand this a little bit and get into the gadget man groove. Now, the th all of your throttle bodies have some kind of mass. This is, this is normally in a round shape. It's normally cast out of either aluminum or uh, some composite material. But it all has a thickness. And that's where the gauge man groove is installed. So here we have the throttle plate. And that's this is the same system. Well, let's insert the gauge man groove here. This is what we did. All right? Now, the, the groove, while it looks simple, it is simple, but it's extremely finicky. It has to be shaped exactly correctly. This intersection point here, the radius of this arc, and this intersection point here, have to, the total variance is six degrees. If you get more than six degrees off, uh, two here, two there, two there, then the groove efficiency drops off by more than 50%. So it's really important that the groove be installed correctly and be properly shaped. That's why I have special bits to do this with. All right, so now as the air hits this plate, it, whatever it hits here comes down, and whatever's closest to the center will become the intake air strain. But if you change the shape of the passage through which a fluid flows, you also change the behavior of the fluid. This is what happens. What, what, as the intake air is speeding up for this portion of the downstroke, the pressure here is building and increasing and increasing because this air speed puts a downward pressure onto the group. So what happens is it winds up splitting the intake air stream about in half. And as the pressure increases, it increases the amount of air being gathered up here. So the air above this line will, will become part of the intake air stream. Below this line, though, is compressed into a dramatic fashion into a little 1 8 inch group. It gathers 40 to 60% of the intake air stream. So it hits there. That little ledge right there will separate the ball and gather this up. But there's more to it than just that. Here's the secret behind the gadget man groove. The air is also falling down this direction here. And when it goes in, it also drops into the groove. 
So from one angle, you've got this big ball of air being scooped up. From the other side, you've got another ball going in this way that when they hit the, together, they collide. When they collide, they roll up in this fashion. So you've got one ball of air here that's extremely dense, and it winds up being about a thousand times more dense than the intake airstream. But the second ball created down here, if this creates this ball, which it does, and this ball creates this ball, then this is one to a thousand, so this becomes a thousand times more dense than this ball, or one million times as dense as the intake airstream. When the, when, the piston pass, when the piston passes the 90 degree point, and, and the, or the crankshaft passes the 90 degree point, and the piston begins to slow down, the aerodynamics reverse. And what happens is the pressure begins to come off of this. Well, there's a big difference between a million times something and a thousand times something. So what happens is this tiny ball of air goes off like the primer in a shotgun shell and shoots that ball of air up into the intake airstream, giving you one huge, one dense ball of air. It rolls on down until it gets to the intake valve, where it's delivered to the piston so it can complete the blending process. When it hits this valve, now up until that point, this intake airstream is keeping those balls rolled. It's like rolling a pencil across a tabletop. The balls are kept in shape until they hit the valve, and when they go in, they expand in an explosive fashion, giving you the turbulence you need to complete the blending process with the fuel vapor that's created during the first half of the downstroke. Here is one downstroke, okay? So the piston begins to drop, the groove gathers air, and then delivers the air to the piston. The effect that that has on this is like this. It causes a drop in the, in the readings from 19 inches of vacuum down to 28 to 29 inches of vacuum and an uh, upper range of about 6. Okay? Now, why is this important? Because below about 26 inches of vacuum, there's not a liquid that we know of that will withstand that pressure and still stay in a liquid state. Now, Right now, what they've done is they've changed our fuel chemistry, guys. Uh, and let me, let me show you what that means. All right, let me find my rack. All right, so now let's, let's look at history here just a little bit. Back in the 30s, 40s, 50s even, we kept hearing rumors of vapor carburetors more intensely in the 60s. And the legends still hang about today of Pogue and Fish and, and Bruce McBurney, who's still living today, by the way, uh, in Niagara Falls. I encourage you to get a hold of him. He's high Mac research. Uh, anyway, you'll like him. Uh, but what they, what they did was they had these carburetors that were configured in such a way they used extremely small apertures to, uh, to allow the gas to be vaporized, to change the aerodynamics. You'll have to do your own research on Venturi's and stuff like that. But it's very interesting once you get into it. Now, what, back in the 60s and before then, our fuel chemistry was relatively simple, consisting of a few mid-level hydrocarbons. That was all there was. So it was very easy to deal with. Well, as the rumors abounded and more and more people said, well, maybe there's something to these vapor carburetors, the, the oil companies said, well, we've got to do something about this. They looked at the technology and they figured a way to defeat it. What they did was they added higher level hydrocarbons to the mix. These are larger and harder to move. And you know, we went from a two pound, uh, two to four pound uh, fuel pump to now a 40 pound fuel pump. Why is that? <laughs> because it take, these are heavier and it takes a lot more pressure to move them through the system. And, and in order to keep the BTU content stable, they had to add higher level hydrocarbons or smaller molecules. And I'll get into that in a minute. But what happened is when this fuel with this enhanced chemistry was, it was put into the carburetors, these larger molecules refused to pass through the openings, and effectively blocking the carburetors and ruining them where they would no longer function. They added these to keep the, the BTU content stable. And just let me give you a demonstration. Uh, if you know anybody that goes out and buys cars from barns, then you'll hear stories about how they found a car that was parked for 40 or 50 years and they just put a battery in it, turned the key, and the thing started. 
Well, how can they do that? Well, because in the mid-70s, with their first ever energy crisis, they, that's when they made the switch over to this fuel. They stopped making gasoline, our reserves were depleted, and then they replaced it with this enhanced and new fuel chemistry. But try leaving your car parked for a year now and see what happens. It won't start. The reason is because these higher level hydrocarbons are so fine that they pass right through the metal linings, the, through, your, through your fuel lines, through your, through your gas tank, and they just vaporize, leaving only the heavier stuff behind. As a result, you've got nothing but jello, and no fuel pump in the world will move it through. So, at, right now, at the point of ignition, what you've got is this fuel goes into your combustion chamber. Well, right now, only about this much of the fuel is actually in a vapor state prior to the point of ignition. Now, I'm going to cover this again and again. You cannot burn a liquid. It has to mix with oxygen before it can burn. Right? So it's got to change state. The smaller the particle doesn't work. Minimizing, like uh, they call it atomizing the fuel. No, that's not what we're doing. We're vaporizing the fuel. Way different in scientific principles. So right now, this is in vapor state at the point of ignition. And what happens is as this burns, it creates heat. And as the heat is applied to the next layer of hydrocarbons, it then vaporizes, mixes with the oxygen, and burns, creating more heat that is then translated to the next layers, so on and so forth, all the way down the line. Now, this is, this is, this is time we're talking about, too, because it, the fuel is only in the engine for a fraction of a second. This is what you get power from. All the rest of this is considered waste fuel. Now, right now in the system, your oxygen sensor is located somewhere right about here. Okay? The oxygen sensor is the primary reference point that the computer uses to determine your air fuel ratio. We don't want to mess with that. We want it to do its job. Well, here, after the gadget man group, though, because of the enhanced vacuum, what you get is you get something like this. Let me change the marker. You get something like this vaporized after the gadget man group, and Vapor state mixes with the oxygen because it hits, gets hit with that blast of air, blends this into a pure air fuel vapor mixture or carbureted mixture. And what happens is at the point of ignition, you have a lot more fuel available to be delivered, to deliver power to your piston. In this system, the oxygen sensor is somewhere right about here. This is really important because in the consumption of the fuel, you're not just consuming fuel, you're also consuming oxygen. So when the computer reads the reduction in the oxygen content, it, and it's there to keep the air fuel ratio correct. So as, as the oxygen level drops, the computer responding the only way it can. It cannot increase the amount of air an engine draws in, so it must reduce the amount of fuel being delivered to keep the air fuel ratio correct. That's why you get the gains in horsepower and torque and why your emissions drop. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is that simple. So what I want you, now that you guys know how the Gage Man Groove does what it does, I want you to go to GageManGroove.com right now and click on Get Groove. It's a very simple thing, easy to do. Now if you're in the Phoenix area, you need to come see me. And I can be done with the whole process in about an hour, and I guarantee you when you leave, you'll know something good has happened to your car. So you can, call, you can call me on my toll-free number at 866-464-2343. That's 866-GO-GADGET. Press 711, and it'll, it'll connect you to my voicemail. Go ahead and, and leave me a message. If you've had the Gadget Man Group done and want to report on it, then dial the same number, 866-464-2343, and press 5, and tell us all about your success with the Gadget Man Group. Ladies and gentlemen, it's simple science. Oh, by the way, two days ago, I got the word that the Gadget Man Groove is cleared on an international patent search. So it's cleared the U.S. Patent Library, and I think it's 137 different countries that the Gadget Man Groove has cleared on the patents. And uh, they, they, said, they cited uh, in certifiable industrial applications. So I'm really thrilled. Now we're going global with this like we've never done before. And you can get to be a part of cleaning up your air and getting more pleasure out of driving your car. God bless you all richly and warmly. Remember GadgetManGroove.com, and we'll see you all on the flip side. Bye-bye now.